Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Causes or Cures. I'm Dr. Eeks, your host, and thanks for joining in. If you are a regular subscriber, awesome. If you're new, I hope you consider subscribing and sticking around. All right. How much do you sleep at night? Did you ever wonder how your sleep duration impacts your health? There's been so much research in this area to the point that sleep is now considered vital. It's a necessity for good health. You can't skip it, right? Today's episode will focus on new research showing how short sleep or sleeping too little increases our risk for type 2 diabetes and how eating a healthy diet won't help reduce that risk. This is interesting because a lot of people think they can control early onset type 2 diabetes or pre-type 2 diabetes or help slow its progression via exercise and a healthy diet. And while that's true, it's so interesting that a healthy diet, at least how they defined a healthy diet in this study, may not help you nearly as much if you aren't getting the proper number of Zs, hours of sleep at night. My guest today is Dr. Deanna Noga, and she is going to talk about her research on the relationship between sleep, diet, and risk of type two diabetes. She is a researcher in Sweden right now and does a lot of work on sleep and health, and she'll tell you more about what she does in the podcast. She'll also explain the theories as to why short sleep is a risk factor for type 2 diabetes. And also, this is interesting, the role exercise may play as a preventive factor if for some reason you can't get enough sleep at night. And for those of you that are a little more nerdy or scientific, it's okay. I will link to her published study in the podcast description so you can check that out. All right. So let's connect to Dr. Gianna here and hear what she has to say. All right, everybody, we are connecting today to Dr. Deanna Noga. And before we dive into her research on sleep duration diet and type 2 diabetes, which is a trending topic uh, here in the U.S. and certainly globally, Diana, thanks for Deanna, thanks for <laughs> joining in to the podcast. And can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the work you do? So thank you for inviting me. Uh, I am uh, from the northeast of Brazil, a very beautiful city called Natal. Uh, I did all my studies in Brazil as well. So I have a bachelor in biomedicine. Then I did master and PhD in uh, psychobiology with emphasis in neurophysiology. And in 2019, I moved to uh, Sweden, to the Uppsala University in Sweden, to continue uh, my research. So I came to a postdoc position. And before, uh, up to this first postdoc position, I worked a lot with animals, actually, not so much human research. So it was more... Um, animal behavior and some neuropharmacological uh, modulations. But then in 2022, I joined uh, the lab that I am now. So I decided I needed a change and I changed subject, I changed everything. So now I'm doing sleep research in humans. So, and I'm part of the lab of Dr. Christian Benedict and in the Department of Pharmaceutical Biosciences. So our main focus is basically how sleep can modulate health outcomes. All right. And how do you like living in Sweden from Brazil? Uh, it's quite different, I have to say. Uh, northeast of Brazil is very warm. Uh, we don't have that uh, that many variation during seasons. So it's usually very stable. Sweden is quite the opposite of that. So the seasons are very, very marked and the winter is very cold and has very little light. So I'm very happy that we are already going to spring. But yes, yeah, a very different <laughs> place. But I'm adapting and it has a lot of good things as well. 
Yeah, yeah, it's always hard to make a jump to a different country and different culture and that kind of thing. Yes, um, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And I've never been to Brazil. Been to Sweden, never been to Brazil, but it's on my list to go. It's very nice to visit, I have to say. We have very, it's a very, very beautiful place, very beautiful people, and yeah. also very good food. Ah, oh, there you go. <laughs> That's all I need. <laughs> good weather and good food. All right, so back to business here. So sleep, duration, diet, and type 2 diabetes. We know that type 2 diabetes is a growing problem, and particularly we're seeing it in younger populations, which is concerning. Can you talk a little bit about how you conducted your study? Yeah, so I agree with you. Type 2 diabetes is a very alarming problem right now, because before, I mean, it's still more common among the people with uh, middle age, let's say 45, 55. But we have this increasing trend in younger people, and it's very concerning because then they have the disease for more time, so they are more susceptible to complications. And also, if you think economically, you are affecting more people in the workforce, so you will even have this added burden. So our study specifically used data from the UK Biobank. So the idea of the UK Biobank, they uh, invited uh, around half a million people in the UK. And these people uh, went to several places there uh, between 20, uh, 2006 and 2011. And they went through a very comprehensive assessment. So they answered a lot of questions about their lifestyle, uh, where they lived, if any of medical uh, history, and they also had blood collected. So it was a very comprehensive assessment. And they also agreed to have the, their medical records linked to the biobank. So you know that in the UK, you have the national health system. So basically every time they go to the doctor and then someone says, okay, this person was diagnosed with, then they give a code, the ICD code. And this is sent back to the biobank. So with this, uh, we can ask this data to the UK Biobank, and this allows us to uh, make correlations. So people that had this behavior or this characteristic during the baseline had a higher or a lower chance of developing, in our case, type 2 diabetes over the period of time uh, since. So in our case, more or less uh, 13 years. So for our specific analysis in this uh, publication, we were interested in the interaction between short sleep and diet uh, with the risk of developing type 2 diabetes. So we divided them uh, in groups of sleep duration. And in our case, we're talking about self-reported sleep duration. So they answer a question, how uh, many hours you sleep per day? And we had groups that were what we call normal sleep duration, so from seven to eight, that's the recommended uh, sleep duration. Then we have people who slept six hours, people who slept five hours, and then people who slept three to five hours per day. And then in the diet side, we based it on a previous publication, and basically uh, we divided them in using a population median split uh, to say that people that eat more fruits, vegetables, and fish, and eat less processed meat or red meat, get higher scores than people who do the opposite. So who eat uh, a low amount of fruits, veggies, and fish, and eat a high uh, concentration of red meat and processed meat. So with this, we made a score. Zero was the worst, and five was the best. And we combine these two things with the risk of developing uh, type 2 diabetes to analyze this data. Of course, we also have to clean this data. So the, in the end, we don't have this half a million people in the, our final analysis, because we have to remove everyone that didn't answer some of the questions that we are interested on. Uh, we are focused on people with short sleep. So anyone that slept more than nine hours was not included in this analysis. Uh, we also removed people that already had diabetes when uh, the baseline was uh, done. So this left us with uh, around two, two, uh, 
a quarter of a million uh, people that had between 38 and 70, uh, 71 years uh, of age, and more, uh, more or less 52% were women. Okay, so it's an adult population. Everyone's in their 30s or above. Basically. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, and the people... <laughs> People who sleep more than nine hours a day, I don't know how, like what they do, but I kind of envy yeah. them. I I know they say that you could sleep too much, but I, I do kind of yeah. envy those people. <laughs> I, I am the possibility of doing that, but not doing it because yeah. long sleep is also associated with yes. several problems. Yeah. But yes, I, I, I am for the availability of sleep. <laughs> okay. So that, that was a great summary in terms of how you guys did your study can you describe some of the main findings for us? So if I had to say the main main finding of the study is that adopting a health a healthy diet or healthy eating uh, regimen may not reduce the risk of developing type 2 diabetes that is associated with short sleep. So basically you cannot compensate short sleep with eating healthy. Of course, considering the diet that uh, the components of the diet that we uh, evaluated but this is a first first study showing that okay diet might not be enough to compensate for short sleep that's so huge. of course that's huge <laughs> yeah because a so, lot of people of think course, diet is so powerful so anyways just yeah listen up listen no no yeah it's true uh so we actually thought it would be <laughs> so we so for for the results what we found was okay we we saw again uh, that short sleep is linked to a, a proved risk of developing type 2 diabetes. So this is not new per se. This was shown before. Uh, we also showed that this diet that we showed that we investigated here protected by itself, so reduced the risk of uh, developing type 2 diabetes. But then it was not enough to compensate for the risk that's associated with sleep. So there was no interaction between diet and sleep there. And, and that's new, uh, that's the novelty here. And it's interesting, right? So it's a bit it's a bit against the general expectation, I have to say, right? So And you got you and your team were surprised by that finding. Yeah, we were uh, somewhat surprised by that because the original I mean, if we think that we have two things that go in the opposite direction regarding risk is more or less logical to hypothesize that one might uh, offset the risk of the other one, uh, but that was not the case. And uh, we have to follow the data, right? And of course, the question would be why? We didn't fully address this here, but we need more investigations to, to be able to, to give a definitive answer. One thing we could think of is that why you sleep short? So it might be by choice, it might be by the pressures of our society that you don't have enough time to sleep, but you also might have some underlying disease and other condition that makes you sleep less than six hours or less than seven hours, seven hours. So it might be that this underlying disease is driving a bit of this effect on, on, on the risk of developing type 2 diabetes, and then the diet cannot interfere so much. But we would need more more things to be able to, to say this. Okay, let me just jump in here. And so when we talk about shorter sleep duration, was there like a cutoff of hours that you saw this at? Or, or did the relationship get stronger the less you slept? Yes. So we had this a bit, those effects. So if you sleep five, so for six hours, uh, with all the confounders that we put there, we didn't have a significant increase. It was a trend. For five hours, we had a, like a 16% increase in the risk. And if it was uh, less than five hours, then it was a 40% increase in the risk. So you had, so the less you sleep, the worse is the risk. And this is also shown in other uh, studies. So you even have a meta-analysis uh, studies that combine several of these uh, observational uh, studies. And they also show this those effects. So the less you sleep, the worse is the risk associated there. 
of course, just remember when I take talk about this this uh, percentages because I, I I see some people getting very uh, scared. So we're talking about a relative risk. So you have normal people have a risk of developing type two diabetes. Then the people that sleep less than normal have a uh, increase in this risk. So it's not that they have a 41% chance of developing type 2 diabetes. They have 41% more risk than the people that don't sleep. And uh, this yeah. short. <laughs> Rel <laughs> well, I, no, I know like whenever you see a headline, right? Like the, it's very rare that someone gets relative risk versus, you know, absolute risk. And uh, yeah. yeah, there's gotta be an easier way to explain that to the public. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's the journalist. Bit, it's, bit, it's like you have a forty-one percent increase. Tricky. No, yeah, it's, it's, it's so a bit tricky. tricky. <laughs> it's tricky. Sometimes it's tricky to explain to researchers, let alone to yeah. to people that are not used to the this yeah, thing. Yeah. But yeah, so you have to think that we had like quarter million people, and only seven thousand six hundred developed type, type two diabetes in this time that we evaluated. So it's already three percent. And then among those, those who slept less than six hours had higher risk than those that who didn't. So it's not that, oh, I sleep six, uh, five hours today, then I'm going to get diabetes. It's not like that. And and it's important that we clarify this so people, so people don't completely freak out. But yeah, we're, we're talking about increased risk. And, and it's still important because is an, a new another factor that can be influencing uh, your health and that's what we want to highlight in the sleep is important for your health so absolutely take care of it and what's interesting too is uh you didn't look at the population that slept more than seven to eight hours yes so this was a bit of a choice because there are some uh, studies showing that long sleep is also associated with type 2 diabetes but there are also studies showing that there is no association. And the thing is uh, that a lot of times this long sleep duration is the result of some underlying disease. So with short sleep, we have, we can have this, but there are some estimates that with long sleep, this is one of the main drivers. So all the underlying conditions that cause this long sleep. This so then sense. we don't have that much evidence for long sleep that uh, for a causal link between long sleep and type two diabetes. For short sleep, we have experimental evidence that reducing the time that, spend, that you spend in bed uh, is associated with a worse glucose metabolism. With long sleep, we don't have that. So then we focus, okay, let's talk more about the one that we have this evidence and then leave this long sleep uh, separate. And that, that makes sense. So. When we talk about why shorter sleep, short sleep is such a strong risk factor for type two diabetes, you mentioned a couple things before you mentioned our lifestyle, you know, we don't sleep a lot. Maybe we're on our phones, uh, Instagramming, yeah. Facebooking, fighting on Twitter, whatever it may be. Um, we have shift work. We're up studying. We don't emphasize sleep. And then you mentioned a couple underlying diseases, perhaps sleep apnea, uh, yes. Yeah. Interrupted so, sleep. Do you, are, so there are there any other theories as to why short sleep is such a strong risk factor for type two diabetes? So yeah. So first, why we sleep short? And you mentioned very well the the main drivers of this. So we live in this bit crazy society nowadays that you need to be connected all the time. We need to answer instantly, and we have our phones on our face until right up to the time we go to bed. And we know that the phones have uh, blue lights and, and so on, and this affects uh, how our brain, uh, I mean, it affects the, the mechanisms that we need to, to uh, start sleeping. And uh, we also have a lot of shift workers that are needed. And then this unfortunately messes a lot with their circadian rhythms and then affects their, their sleep. And we can have some underlying diseases. So one that uh, happens a lot is the obstructive sleep apnea. That's when 
the muscle that supports the soft tissue uh, on your throat and your tongue and palate, the, uh, relax a bit. And then in the middle of the night, you stop breathing, basically, because it cl the, the airway is closed there. And there is an estimation that 1 billion people suffer from this, uh, and almost uh, and eighty percent of those people don't know it. So, one billion. Because, yes, there's wow. a, a recent a study showing this sleep apnea, and that's the one that's usually diagnosed by if you sleep with a partner because they might hear you snoring, right? Or not diagnosed, yeah, they might but hear, detected. Uh, <laughs> and and some, and you have even to separate because the there's the snoring in there is the actually uh, stop breathing is a bit yes. uh, so you might snore and not not have uh, ulcer right but is a very common uh, disease let's say and in lack of a better word and it affects a lot the sleep so it it reduces the sleep duration but it also uh, can affect specific um, moments of your sleep because in this study we are talking about sleep duration that's what we had access to right but we also have during your sleep we have different sleep stages right we have REM sleep we have non-REM sleep and during this non-REM sleep we still have the deep sleep right and there are some studies in the lab showing that having the obstructive sleep apnea during REM sleep seems to be more important for uh, affecting negatively your glucose metabolism than during the non-REM sleep. So you still you not only have the duration of the sleep, but also when it happens. Because all the obstructive uh, sleep apnea that I'm saying, Ozana, uh, it not only reduces the time you spend in bed, but it also fragments your sleep, which is also very uh, complicated for your health. That's that's interesting. I didn't know that. So when you stop breathing, what stage of sleep you're in matter could matter be a significant yes. factor. Interesting. Yes. Huh. So that's uh because there are some studies. So okay, we have these factors that drive a bit why you sleep short, and then the relationship between a short sleep and uh type two di diabetes was investigated in some uh, experimental studies. But then you have you need to have in mind that they cannot uh, directly investigate type two diabetes. They will investigate the metabolism of glucose because I cannot induce di diabetes in someone, and I cannot or keep them in this experimental condition long enough for them to develop type two diabetes. But what these experimental uh, studies show, basically, what they do is they get um, a group of people. Uh, usually most of them are healthy young individuals and then they keep these people either one day without sleep a completely complete day without sleep or uh, three to five days or maximum one week with reduced sleep so if they are allowed the maximum of four four and a half hours of sleep and then after this intervention they will measure uh, something related to the glucose metabolism most of the times they do this oral glucose tolerance test. So basically you drink a glucose solution and then you measure the glucose levels over time. So you see how they respond. But they also there are also other uh, measures they make. And then these studies have, have shown that you have uh, reduced sensitivity to insulin uh, after sleep deprivation in both uh, general, also looking at tissue. So they look at the muscular tissue, they looked at the adipose tissue, and both of them had reduced uh, insulin sensitivity. Uh, you also have higher, this sleep deprivation also increases your cortisol levels, and cortisol uh, causes the release of restored glucose, and then your glucose level go up. They also increase the sympathetic tone in, uh, in your body, so and this is also associated with releasing uh, some of the glycose and also producing glycose on, on your liver. So you have several mechanisms that are associated with short sleep that could be responsible for the development, more or less, of type 2 diabetes. Okay, so that's really interesting. So that's there's a connection there. 
uh, you can't really say anything causal, but, and just to summarize for our listeners, you have increased insulin resistance and then, so the sugar is not going to go into the cells. So it's going to, the sugar levels are going to stay high yes, in high. your blood and, exactly. and then increase and cord cortisol, which is the stress hormone. I think folks are familiar with that. So exactly. Be, and and the thing about cortisol, yeah, 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 the thing about cortisol is that it it's a stress it's a stress related hormone right? right and it's also released when you are in this state that if you remember our very early uh, physiology class the flight or, or fight right. fight or flight so you imagine you imagine you, you you need energy and one thing the cortisol does is actually we have some stored glucose in our body and what it does it just releases this in the system so it will increase your glucose levels and okay. the similar, more or less, thing will happen with when I say increases the sympathetic tone. It increases your adrenaline, and right. it will have more or less similar effect. Right. So basically, it's associated with more sugar in your blood and less insulin, uh, or at least not less, less insulin, but less response to insulin. So right. the sugar will stay there. The cells are not opening their door to insulin. Uh <laughs> I, I like Chocolate I, cold, yeah, yeah. I, not that not that our cells have doors, but I but I just like to <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> visual, visualize everything. Yeah. Um, but no, I think that's interesting, and I think chronic cortisol is is it's like a chronic stress, right? Is it safe? Yes. To, yeah, chronic stress. Which okay, so given type two diabetes is a major public health concern, I suppose we could probably also call call short sleep a public health concern at this. Concern. Yeah, yes. At this point, what do you think, or what would you say are the main public health implications of your research? So we want to, what we are saying here is once again, sleep matters, right? I, uh, we have this thing, uh, especially with the, the idea that we have to be productive all the time and so on. Some people started with the idea that sleep is a waste of time, right? I, I often hear this, oh, study when they are sleeping, work when they are sleeping, and then you're going to be better. And it's not very true. It's actually very wrong. <laughs> uh, sleep is extremely important for your health. So, and not only, I mean, we're talking about diabetes, but is for so many other things, including your mood and also your performance, your cognitive performance, your physical performance, and so on. So we are not trying to say, oh, again, you don't sleep, then then you get diabetes. We're saying again that sleep matters. Pay attention to it. You should try the best you can to have a good sleep, and it matters so much that. Sometimes it cannot be compensated by something else. So it cannot, it's, it seems at least that it may not be compensated by diet. Of course, there are other types of diet that might do this, but these more common things like, okay, I with more veggies, I with more fruits and so on, don't seem to do it. Of course, there are other things that might do it. So there are other studies showing that um, physical activity may offset a bit this risk associated with short sleep. So it's important that we say that. So we had uh, two, let's say, main studies uh, showing this. We had one actually with the OK Biobank, but it's a bit different from ours because they used the uh, accelerometry data. So basically, one quarter, one fifth of the people from the UK, the original UK Biobank group they came, I think, five years later, and they uh, they accept to wear a device for one week. And this device is basically measuring how active they are. And with this, they can also track how, how long they slept in a more objective way. So it doesn't depend on their own answers. It's a more objective measurement of their sleep and also of their physical activity during the day. And this one showed that people with short sleep, again, had higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Didn't see the same for long sleep. In this case, they, they had both. But they saw that if you had short sleep, but had a moderate or high level of physical activity, then uh, this increased risk associated with short sleep was not 
there anymore. So it seems that physical activity could compensate for this uh, type 2 diabetes risk associated with short sleep. That's and there was another study also, in this case, with uh, a small group of young men where they had these normal sleepers and then short sleepers and then short sleepers with high uh, intensity interval tra training, heat. And then the exercise was, this exercise, let's say high intensity, was enough to also uh, prevent the effects that were seen in short sleep duration. So yes, there are some things that might offset, diet might not be the one, but the main message is, is still is sleep matters. sleep matters. So try as much as you can, of course, in, in the helm of your possibility uh, to improve your sleep. So try to create a routine, try to sleep more or less in the same hour, try to have a moment where you start to wind down so I'm not watching too many things or with the, my phone on my face and then immediately turn everything off and expect my, uh, that I go to sleep. So try to create these routines. And even if you, yeah, even if you strive to do that and you're still not managing to sleep, maybe you should ask for uh, advice from a medical doctor or from someone specializing on this that can because it might be that you have some underlying cause that you are not aware of and you might be able to treat that. And That's a good point. Sleep. That's a good point. I actually, I have a sleep ritual. I like what you said there uh, because you're so right. It's not a badge of honor. Too little sleep is not a badge of honor. It's not like, oh, you're such a hard worker. You know, wow, you, you didn't sleep. Look at all this product. That's, that's BS we have to sleep exactly, and you're much healthier in the long run. I just had a researcher on to talk about the link between lo too little sleep and cognitive decline. So like, as you said, there's yeah. so many other reasons, but for my sleep ritual, I actually, I do, I put on pajamas and then I make sure like everything's off, like phones off, TVs off, like no distraction and just kind of honor that time when I'm supposed to sleep. And I didn't used to do that. Yeah. Like, and yeah. it's important because the thing is, we, we got so used to do these things, you have the phones and so on, that we didn't realize what they were doing. And then we started to see more people with difficulty to fall asleep, more people with short sleep. So we, we, we start to look at it and, okay, we need to calm down our brains to help it go into the, the sleep. And, and the other thing that people often forget and is like, as much as possible, your bedroom should be bedroom, not... TV room, not uh, playing room, just bedroom. Kitchen, so, office, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> so our brains are very associative <laughs> machine. So if it's just a bedroom, it's, it's, uh, we will associate that this place is a place I go to sleep. Yeah. And this helps you to go to sleep. Yep. So it's also, I mean, of course, I know that's not possible for everyone. Yeah. But maybe the idea of a large screen on your bedroom is not the best one. Yeah. I just, I'm just, I was laughing because I'm in, in New York City and just thinking of all the ways people sleep here. It's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I can, I can understand that. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, but I love that. And then even, and the, the lights too, for, you need dark for the melatonin to come out, the vampire exactly. hormone, so, which helps, which is your friend and helps you sleep. So sleep, yeah. um, I wanted to go it's... back really quick when you mentioned the physical activity might be a preventative factor to too little sleep. And you mentioned high intensity interval training. I think that's what the acronym stands for. Yeah. Was Did you look at, or could you talk about, was there specific types of exercise? Was it cardio or resistance training or we're not sure? Uh, they you they only talk, about, no, yeah, no, they, they talk about the, the load that they had. So they describe it as they, needed to reach like 90% 90, 90 of their maximum, their peak uh, load of exercise. And I think they did this for uh, three minutes and then they had a 75 seconds where they would go down to 60% of the maximum load. So they actually, in this one, they explain very cl clearly uh, which was the exercise that they used uh, because there were some other studies with less intense exercise that didn't show this effect. 
So some of them using only this 60% and couldn't see it. Uh, but for the one that was the one from the UK Biobank, they mentioned that what they call moderate uh, physical activity. Basically, they actually did what the World Health recommend, uh, World Health Organization recommends as um, moderate physical activity. And they say that if you uh, go for that, you already reduce the risk. So it will, the idea is as many as possible, stay active, because even if you don't fully offset this with, let's say, lower level of physical activities, it already helps. So again, we're preaching the same things, right? Sleep yeah, yeah, and I know. <laughs> exercise. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it seems so simple and then nobody does yeah. it. Um, no. Okay, exercise. So cardio, a little bit of cardio, a little bit of resistance cardio. training, so just so move around, yes. lift some weights. Move around. Move around. Shake a little. Move okay. around, yeah. I know that for US and Brazil, that's <laughs> not so much about walking to places, right? We don't do that car everywhere. Uh, so here, Europe at least has this more, it's more widespread to cycle and, and walk, and that helps already a lot. But of course, in the, let's say, directed physical exercise. So I'm going to put this half an hour to, or one hour to actually engage in active physical exercise is important. Yeah. It's so funny you mentioned that because I was just talking to someone they were like, oh, Aaron, why don't you ride your bike in the bike lane in New York City? I'm like, because I'm not suicidal. Like, I just, I just don't want to risk it because, you know, it's just, it's not, but if you go to Germany, you know, and you see their bike lanes, you're like, okay, that's bike friendly. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, if so. and if they have bike lanes, right? Because in my oh, city, yeah. for my Natal, for example, you barely have them. In Brazil, and some of them you have to yeah, and some of them you have to share with buses. So oh, I think fun. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> that sounds it's appealing. Completely, <laughs> it's completely different from Uppsala, for example, where you can basically go anywhere in a bike, and people here bike in the winter with snow. It doesn't matter; it's, they are biking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, I didn't know. realize that. So Brazil is not a walking country for the majority. For most, for the majority of what I know, no. no. It's a lot. Okay. It's, Brazil tends to try to mirror the US a lot. So we have this car culture very strong uh, there. Okay. Okay. It's not working out well for us. So just FYI, Brazil. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> we don't learn from other people who speak. Yeah. <laughs> The cars are easy and nice, but uh, we got to yeah. watch ourselves. Um, Deanna, thank you so much for this. I guess my last question here, what future research are you working on? Are you doing things similar uh, in this area or something new? Yeah, so we have some things more or less similar. So we still have some other questions with this biobank data uh, regarding sleep, diet, and different health outcomes and also regarding people that work night shifts or not or um, working shifts night shifts and, and normal or working time because besides the sleep we also have this this thing uh, the circadian, uh, circadian rhythm so uh, it's important for us to try as much as possible to keep our sleep uh, schedule similar during the days and other factors that influence uh our rhythms and shift work is kind of the, the enemy of all that. So it we also want to investigate some things with uh, shift work. We will probably next semester start uh, another project, in this case involving actually experimental uh, data. So we will have people and we'll track their sleep for uh, at least two weeks and also track their glucose levels and uh, investigate relationships there, but in this time with uh, objective measurement for a longer period of time, and also a measurement that allow us, allows us to check this slip staging that we didn't have, for example, in this data. This is great and, stuff. Yeah, and we are finishing one project, but this one is a bit, I mean, the only relationship in this case is sleep uh -huh. because it's a project working with uh, sleep deprivation as well. In this case, one night of full sleep deprivation, but in investigating the interaction of the menstrual cycle with this sleep deprivation, because that, that's another thing that we often don't do. It's like 
investigate women, they are not taking contraceptive pills. So normal menstrual, normal, normal cycling women, uh, and how this hormonal variation that we have in the menstrual cycle might affect uh, other things. So we are trying to investigate this a bit now. Uh, and it's so nice to for, you know, like the research to kind of come out now. You know, I I just and I I, I had a um, someone a researcher, a uh, former colonel from the military on, and and they talk they he was describing this sort of new holistic approach to soldier readiness and fitness, and sleep is now a critical component of that. And finally, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, when I was at I went to the military academy. We were always told sleep is a crutch, sleep is a crutch, you know, and they would wake us up during training and stuff like that. And so it's so nice to see it kind of come full circle because I remember being sleep deprived and I was miserable, like depressed, like just, you know. Exactly. It affects you in so many ways. Yeah, yeah. And Uh, and and it's it's also a thing that I think is important for healthcare and everything because when you do this, at least uh, when in these experiments, for example, sometimes I, I had to stay awake all night with with the person that's participating in the study. And then, of course, they do it once. I had to do more <laughs> than once, for sure. And at some point I was like, man, imagine that I would be making life uh, or death decisions on someone else, for someone else, and this stay is not the best, I have to say. That's a, that's a really good point. In fact, when I don't sleep very well, I always tell myself, do not make any big decisions today. Uh, I just exactly, don't, because I, I can notice it in myself. Like you're not 100%. You could be like a little bit depressed right now, cognitive declined, whatever. Don't make any big decisions, yeah. but you're so right. Um, and I do feel for the shift workers though. And uh, life was so much easier when you could just wake up when the sun rose up and like go to bed when the sun when it gets dark like it yeah was it so was simple, easier but... for sure we had to go and complicate I... everything so... yeah i don't know <laughs> in, in the north of sweden but yeah, in the rest of the world <laughs> <laughs> yeah. anyway this was great thank you so much for your time thank you today connecting and um yeah this was very informative so thank, thank you, you so much and nice to meet you <laughs> nice to meet you too. All right. Enjoy the rest of your day there. Yeah, I have experiments tonight. So <laughs> Oh no. So you actually have to stay up all night? Yeah. And oh. then today I don't I don't stay up, I sleep, but then yeah, I have a, from eight <laughs> until ironic, home. isn't it? It's kind of yeah, ironic. Yeah, yeah. You can yeah. be you can do your own case study. <laughs> we always joke that sleep researchers are the worst <laughs> sleepers <laughs> ever, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, okay. Maybe uh, we, we can talk, write up your own case study. I'm happy. We could talk about that yeah. on the podcast too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks again. Bye bye. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for joining in for today's episode. Let me know what you thought on Facebook, Instagram, or X, or email me, Aaron at bloomingwellness.com. And don't forget to come back and check out more episodes. Subscribe, share, and the link to subscribe to my newsletter, which I send out once a month, is posted in the podcast description. Going forward, guest authors will be contributing pieces to the newsletter, so take a gamble and subscribe. If you don't like it, you can always unsubscribe. That's the beauty of it. (laughs) Okay, and now it's time for the closing quote from the great cat lover and writer, Some of you know him more as a writer, Ernest Hemingway. Here it is. I love sleep. My life has a tendency to fall apart when I'm awake, you know? All right, that's it. And see you here next time. Bye for now.